You're getting settled in and opening your copy of God's Word this morning to the book of Galatians. Let me mention that in the bulletin you received when you came in here and also in the venue, there was a card. It simply says prayer service request at the top. Each month, uh, we gather the first Sunday night of the month just to pray. And our focus uh, tonight is to pray for specific needs within the body. And so what we'd like to do is not just pray for your need. Uh, We pray for needs every week. We have a prayer team of about 300 plus um, that get those needs and pray for them. We would like tonight to be able to personally pray over you and uh, pray for the need that you have. So if you would plan to be here tonight, that'll be at six o'clock up in the venue. If you would just check that top box that you plan to attend and then jot down for us uh, what your need is. Um, and then if, if you can't attend, but you'd like to pray specifically for that need tonight, if you would write that down in the next section there. And as you lead this morning, you can drop those cards in the baskets and that will help us be prepared tonight as our staff and deacons and others of our prayer team will be gathered tonight to pray for you and to pray for your need because that's what we do in the body. So I hope you'll consider that tonight. Well, last week we began our study in the book of Galatians. You'll remember that Paul was writing the Galatian churches, not one city, but a an area of, uh, of Asia. These churches had been um, infiltrated by false teachers, uh, by Judaizers, who were basically telling them they had to earn the grace of God by keeping the law. You see, the Judaizers, Judaizers believed in the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made, but they couldn't comprehend, comprehend the idea that salvation, that that sacrifice was freely offered to, to everyone who would believe. And, and the reason was forgiveness of sin from, from such a holy God couldn't possibly happen without something from the sinner. In other words, they basically believe that Christ did die for us to atone for our sins on the cross, but the payment that Christ made was not enough. There had to be some kind of payment from us. So they believed the grace of God was offered to anyone who was uh, able to earn that. There was something that we would have to do to pay off the debt Um, that the Lord Jesus paid for us on the cross. So in the case of the Judaizers, it was faith plus keeping the Mosaic law. Uh, You had to keep all of the Mosaic law to be made right with God. And you remember last week we said the central message of, of Galatians is justification by God's grace through faith. What is grace? It's unmerited favor. It can't be earned. It is a, is a gift, not something that you can work for. And so if we add anything to that free grace, to the work Christ did on the cross, basically we are, we are canceling out grace. Because if we work, if we earn it, if we deserve it, then it's not unmerited favor. It's not freely given. And if that's the case, then Christ did not need to die for us. So our salvation is based on not grace plus works, but grace alone. And you remember last week, back in chapter 1, verse 7, Paul's confronting the Galatians because he says that you're turning from the truth to a different gospel that is really no gospel at all. And it's not a gospel. If it's not grace alone, it's not the gospel. The gospel is good news. The good news is that while we can't earn or deserve, we can't do anything to compensate for our sins, God has already done that for us in the work that Christ did on the cross. Now, why are we studying Galatians? Well, that same departure from the truth is just as serious an issue in our day. There, there are many people today, and, and you know them, they're in your family, they're, they're neighbors, they're coworkers who, who think they're made right with God by faith plus works. But again, when you add works to the gospel, you deny the necessity of what Christ did on the cross of, of his death. You, you nullify the death of Christ on the cross. It's absolutely meaningless at that point. And those who believe that it takes faith plus works are falling right into Satan's plan. What's his plan? To deny the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. To deny that that grace alone is adequate and and to promote a gospel of of works. That anyone who's going to come to Christ has to work. And that declares basically that man's sufficiency is greater than the sufficiency of Christ. And the false teachers who lead people to uh, deny the true gospel... Those people that deny the true gospel don't recognize that actually instead of being accepted by God, they're causing themselves to be separated from God because they don't accept the work that Christ has done on the cross. That false gospel is propagated extensively in our culture today, just as much so or even more so than in the the time that this letter was written to the Galatians. There are many, many groups in our day-to-day that preach a false gospel, and we need to be wary. 
And we need to make sure that we know and understand the truth. Now, I don't go around looking to pick fights, but I think it's important for a shepherd to caution the flock and to point out false teachers and false teaching. And I don't want to pick on any one particular group, but I need to tell you that the largest purveyor of the false gospel today is a very well-respected denomination. In fact, many of you, if not all of you in this room, know someone, uh, close friends or family members who are part of this particular denomination. Some of you in this room grew up under the teaching of this particular denomination. And I mention it because it is so large. There are somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 billion Catholics worldwide. Now, I don't mean to offend you if, if that's your background or if you have family who are still part of the Catholic Church. I'm not going to say this morning that all Catholics are, are lost and apart from Christ, but I believe many are because I can say unapologetically that the Catholic Church as a whole does teach, does teach a false gospel. Now, the Catholic Church does many good things. I particularly am incredibly grateful for their stance on life. For years, the Catholic Church was leading the charge while we were just sitting back doing nothing. I'm very grateful for some of the good things they do, but just as there are many good people who haven't accepted the gospel, a good church can also reject the true gospel. Most of you have probably heard of a guy by the name of Martin Luther. A little over 500 years ago, Martin Luther started or launched the Protestant Reformation. Let me tell you just a bit about Luther's story. Luther was actually studying law, and he was out one evening, and a lightning bolt struck so close to where he was standing that that moved him per, from pursuing a career in law to going into the ministry and to becoming a monk, and he moved into a monastery. In the monastery, under the teaching he received there, he found the road to salvation to be very difficult. He was taught that salvation was by grace, but that grace was not free. You, you had to earn grace. You had to come to a certain level of worthiness or accumulate a certain amount of merit. And Luther was absolutely terrified uh, of God and of judgment. He, he knew he was not worthy uh, of the grace of God. And so Luther went to incredible extremes of sacrifice. He gave himself over to every conceivable and, and inconceivable form of, of discipline. He denied himself food and sleep. He fasted so often that many of his friends thought that he was going to die from his fast. He made pilgrimage to, pilgrimages to earn, uh, hopefully, some extra merit, but he was continually tortured by fear and by guilt. He could not get over the reality of his sinfulness. Luther was known for his confession. Now, we should confess sin. When we sin, we should confess sin. But Luther would confess repeatedly and incessantly for up to six hours to the point that the priest that he would go to for his confession finally told him, do not come back unless you commit adultery or fornication. He didn't want to hear it anymore. Luther wanted to be right with God. He's a great theologian. He, he understood God. He understood God's wrath. He understood the, the reality of an eternal punishment in hell. And, and let me just say, the fear of God is a good thing. It drives people to repentance and reconciliation with God. But for Luther, that was a consuming thing in his life, and he could never find peace. His works and all his confession never brought any reconciliation. And the road to salvation, as it's presented by the Catholic Church, is hard. In fact, it is so hard that the Catholic Church invented, it's not in Scripture, invented a place called purgatory. Purgatory is the place for people who are, are, are too bad to go to heaven, but too good to go to hell. Let me read to you from the Catholic Encyclopedia, and, and you can look this up yourself online. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, purgatory is a state of final purification after death and before entrance into heaven for those who died in God's friendship but were only imperfectly purified. It is a final cleansing of human imperfection before one is able to enter the joy of heaven. Now, in life, for, for the Catholics, purification while you're living comes down to keeping the sacraments and prayer and good works. But if you die and you're still not uh, completely purified, you have to go to purgatory. 
And I want to tell you this morning, a lack of, a, a lack of purification problem is a lack of Jesus problem. Purification doesn't come by our works or anything that anyone else could, could do for us. In 1 John 1, 7, John clearly tells us the blood of Jesus purifies. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and or to forgive us and cleanse or to purify us. Purification doesn't come from anything we can do. It comes only from the blood of Christ. And I guess for Luther, the best thing he could hope for w- was purgatory. Fortunately, because Luther was a student of the word, he came to understand the correct and truthful message of the gospel, justification by faith alone. In fact, the book of Galatians was a big part of the Reformation movement. Now, let's pick up in Galatians where we left off last week in chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 10 through the end of the chapter, through verse 24. So Paul asks the question, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man Nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he, that is God, who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. So Paul has stated, we covered this last week, the issue of a a false gospel. Now he is defending his role as an apostle and his authority as a messenger of the true gospel. Now, I don't have to tell you that we live in a culture today that, that struggles with truth. Our society doesn't believe in, in absolute truth. In fact, absolute truth has pretty much been, been thrown out. And you know we've gotten to the point of insanity in our denial of truth when we can't even define a man or a woman. And I'm not a biologist, but I think I could pretty well do that. I'm sorry, that was came out. You know, if you, if you deny absolute truth, you, you have to deny absolute authority. And, and you recognize that puts the church, that puts us in, in a confrontational and in an oppositional position with our culture. Why? Because we believe in an absolute truth proclaimed by an absolute authority. That's who we are. That's where we stand as, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what would be the most offensive statement you could make in a culture that has thrown out absolute truth and authority, you know what the the most offensive statement you can make is? There is one God. Or you could say there is one God and one Savior. Or you could say there is one God and one Savior and one truth. Or you could say there is one God, one Savior, and one truth, and this is the truth. Jesus is the way, the only way. Jesus is the truth, the only truth. Jesus is the life, the only life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Paul is speaking on absolute truth. He is speaking with absolute authority. So those who came declaring a different truth, the only way they could deny the message of Paul was to deny his authority. And so they had to attack his authority. And the first thing they said is, well, Paul's a people pleaser. Paul was coming into the Gentile world and he wanted to be accepted. He wanted to be popular. He wanted his gospel to be attractive to the Gentiles. So he, he stripped away the works requirement to make the gospel easy. And in case you're wondering why we're considering the attack on Paul's authority, Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. 
Almost half of what we have in our New Testament is written by Paul. So we want to be assured uh, of his authority because we need to know that he speaks and writes with the authority of God. We want to know that he's an acceptable source of information, that he's an expert on the subject. That's why we're considering the, the authority of Paul and the authority of the message that he wrote. And, and the Judaizers and the false teachers were trying to raise doubt among the Galatians uh, about Paul's authority. They said, are, are, are you sure you can trust Paul? How do you know that Paul is speaking the true gospel? How do you know that Paul's not making this up to get people to follow him? Why does Paul have the right to, to speak for God? Now, as we look at verse 10, where Paul asks a question, am I trying to seek the approval of man or God? If you back up to verse 8 and 9, last week we saw that Paul pronounced a double curse on anyone teaching a gospel different than what he was teaching. I don't think Paul is going to go very far in being popular when he starts calling out other religious leaders. He's certainly not trying to keep the peace and trying to please men. In fact, if you look over the life of Paul's ministry, it's abundantly clear he was not a people pleaser. He didn't care what people thought. He was just going to present the truth of the gospel no matter what. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul said, I make it my ambition to please Christ. That's all that mattered to him. That's all that he cared about. And he had the scars to prove it. Paul was beaten with a whip and beaten with, with rods many times. Paul was stoned and, and left for dead because of his stand for the gospel, the, the true gospel. And so to answer Paul's question here in verse 10, Paul was a slave of Christ. He, he was not a, a pleaser of men. He accepted the punishment he received of men in order to please Christ and in order to be faithful to the gospel. As a slave of Christ, he calls out the, the deceit of these false teachers, and that's what a minister of the gospel must do. The way that we defend the flock and make sure they understand the truth, part of that is calling out those who are false teachers as we defend the gospel. And, and a true minister of the gospel is going to declare God's word no matter what people think, no matter how unpopular, no matter the consequence. I will occasionally have people say to me, about something I said during a message, boy, that's, that's really brave. And my response typically is this, I'm not brave. I'm a coward. I know that one day I have to stand before God for what I've said to you. And I'm afraid of him. I'm not afraid of man. Well, before we're too hard on the Galatians, I need to make sure you understand they didn't have the scriptures that we have today. The New Testament was not written. In fact, Galatians is either the first or second book written of the New Testament. The Gospels had not yet been written at this point. If you go back to Acts 2, when the, when the church was first uh, founded in Acts chapter 2 there in Jerusalem, if you look, when it describes what the church is doing, it says they devoted themselves to the Gospels. Is that what it says? Do you know? What did they devote themselves to? The apostles' teaching. The gospels had not yet been written. So that makes it a little more clear why Paul is having to defend himself and more importantly having to defend the message that he has written. They didn't have the gospels. They had the teaching of the apostles. And I said that to say we have no excuse today for being led astray by a false gospel because we have the complete authoritative word of God. And this is the standard. And this is what we hold any teacher and any group up to. If anyone speaks contrary to this book, you need to question what they say. If anyone says something is, is right and it's not in this book, then they're wrong. Many of you know we're in the middle of, a, of an upward um, soccer season, about halfway through. Phenomenal ministry. We have over 400 children, plus their parents, families, all that, um, out at, at Raymar Fields every Saturday, 1,000 plus people. Incredible ministry opportunity. Well, I played soccer in, in high school, and I really loved the game. And so when Upward started eight or ten years ago, I started uh, serving as a referee for Upward Soccer. I do that every Saturday that I'm able to. I'm 61. I still run up and down the field. Most of the other referees are teenagers. <laughs> so I'm kind of the granddaddy of the referees, right? Now, I know the game well, I know the rules, but sometimes in upward soccer, the rules are a little bit different. Well, I know the game so well that I, every year when I go to the training that Justin provides for referees, I don't take it upon myself to read the rule book, because I know the rules. Yesterday, I made a call that cost a team a goal. 
And during one of the breaks between periods, another referee, not calling this game, but on the sideline, called me over and opened the rule book, showed me the rule. 16-year-old young lady. Yeah. You know what I did? I reversed the call. She was right. And kudos to her for being willing as a 16-year-old young lady to call a 61-year-old man out and say, hey, you're not following the rules. You made the wrong call. Now, I'm not encouraging young people who are listening to my voice today to question authority. I'm not encouraging that. But I am saying we need to know what's right. Somebody, when I went over the sidelines, some of the adults were laughing and said, listen, whatever call he made is right. Like, he's the pope. (laughs) No, I'm not. And if I was the pope, and I'm not speaking the truth, you should call me out. Okay? It's not about questioning authority. It's about knowing the truth and making sure if someone is wrong, you ought to be brave enough to point it out to them, especially when it comes to the truth of God's word. Good job, Reagan Denny. I was told she's not easily embarrassed. I can't see from here. All right, verse 11 and 12. Paul explains where he got his message. He says, look, it's not my words. I didn't make it up. I didn't even receive it from another apostle. How did he get his message? He got it by direct revelation from God himself. That's the same way that the 12 got it. They spent three years, over a period of three years with Jesus, they received the message from him over that period of three years. Now, here's a very interesting parallel. Look at verses 16 through 18. Paul has this life-changing encounter with Jesus. He doesn't consult any man. He doesn't go confer with the apostles in Jerusalem. He goes off by himself to Arabia, later Damascus. Look at verse 18. After three years, he returned to Jerusalem. The three years that Paul was away, he was receiving the same thing the disciples received over three years with Jesus, the direct revelation of the gospel. So Paul didn't consult with anyone. He didn't receive training from the other apostles. The visit you see there that he made to Jerusalem wasn't for training. It was just a short visit, just 15 days, just to become acquainted with with Peter. Listen, Paul already knew the facts of Jesus' life. He knew the claims that, that Jesus made, but he had no understanding of the gospel. That Damascus encounter was a supernatural encounter where God opened his eyes, and his three years of the revelation of the gospel that he received was supernatural. And I mention that to you to say this, if you have come to Christ, if you've come to an understanding of the gospel, you have experienced a supernatural work in your life. And sometimes we don't, we don't realize that. We don't, we don't think about that. Only God can remove the veil and open your eyes. Do not ever say you've never seen the supernatural hand of God in your life if you've come to faith in Christ and if you understand the gospel. That's a supernatural work. Verses 13 through 15, Paul uh, offers his pre-conversion and conversion experience. He says, look, in my former life, I was an enemy of God. I was attacking the church and persecuting the church and even hoping to to destroy the church. I was advancing in Judaism. I was was full speed ahead, but in the wrong direction. Paul was a fanatic. He was a zealot. He was a legalist pursuing the gospel of men. But then came Paul's conversion, verse 15. You know, but God has to be the most exciting phrase in the Bible. It signifies that God is about to intervene in human affairs, and we certainly need that, don't we? Verse 15, but when he, that's God, but when he, when God in his sovereign will, in his sovereign timing, when it pleased God, God intervened in the life of Paul. Paul's going headlong in one direction, and there's an immediate reversal. There's a sudden stop, and then a 180-degree turn. That's what we call repentance, and, and Paul's going the other direction. Only divine activity can explain that. Anyone who knew Paul would have to say, God clearly did something in Paul's life. And here's the thing. It was God's initiation and God's plan, look, which was set before Paul was born. God had planned it all along. And I say that to say to you, some of you have been praying for a loved one for many, many years, and you've gotten perhaps discouraged and you want to give up, but it's God's initiation and God's plan, 
And God's timing, God had set Paul apart before birth, knowing all the the stuff that Paul was going to do against the church and the way he was going to pursue Christians. But God in his time intervened in Paul's life. Don't stop praying for that loved one. You may not even have opportunity to see God's intervention in your lifetime on this earth, but don't stop praying for that loved one. God does intervene. And I remind you again of the supernatural ability of God in your life. You look at the testimony of someone like Paul and you say, wow, what an incredible miracle of God. So is your salvation and so is mine. Only a miracle of God could rescue you from the kingdom of darkness. Only a miracle of God could allow your eyes to be open. God miraculously intervened in your life and mine when we came to faith in Christ. It was a miracle of God. Well, I love the conclusion of chapter one. He says the churches in Judea had heard about his miraculous transformation, and what did they do? They praised God. Our transformation should continually bring praise to God. I I thought of Jesus' declaration in Matthew 5, 16, that our light is to shine before men in such a way that they see our Father and and glorify him. You know, our walk, the way that we live, combined with our, our words, what we say is the most effective tool to advance the gospel. And the question would be, will those I encounter see a difference in me? Will they all come to Christ? No. But will those I encounter see in me God's miraculous life-changing power? They should. Well, very quickly, in in chapter 2, these first 10 verses of chapter 2, Paul continues his defense of the true gospel by pointing to his acceptance by the apostles in Jerusalem. You see that he makes a, a second trip. He's still not going there to receive their seal of approval. The reason Paul went back to Jerusalem is in verse two, God directed him to go. So he's going to please God, not looking for the pleasing or approval of men. He's going because God told him to go. And the apostles who were in Jerusalem, who were working among the Jews, not Gentiles, they needed to consider their own relationship to the gospel they were proclaiming. And, and what it meant. Paul wasn't there to receive their approval. He was there um, because God sent him and he wanted them to think about the gospel that they were presenting. Paul couldn't change the gospel message. It wasn't his message. It was given to him directly by God. And one of the neat things you see in chapter two is the apostles there in Jerusalem evidently accepted The gospel Paul was preaching because Paul had a man named Titus with him. Titus was an uncircumcised believer. He was a Greek, and the apostles accepted Titus and didn't require him to keep the law. If you look in verse 2 of chapter 2, Paul's comment is he fears he might have run his race in vain. That's referring to the fact that if the apostles insisted that those coming to Christ had to be circumcised and keep other requirements of the law. Those Gentile believers would have to do that. If they insisted on that, then all the work that Paul had done, his ministry was going to be hindered by these Judaizers who required faith plus works. Look at verse 6. Again, Paul's not looking for the approval of men, but he makes note they added nothing to his message. His message was adequate. His message of the gospel was a message that God had given. And the true gospel has not changed. It's the same gospel today. The true gospel has not changed. The true gospel will not change. There will never be any other way to be reconciled with God than through Jesus and his atoning work on the cross. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you're saved by grace through faith. Not of your own doing. That's the most important part of this passage. Not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not works. If it was works, you could boast about it. We could all gather around in here on a Sunday morning and we could brag about all the good things we've done. And yeah, I think I've finally achieved salvation. I'm I'm good to go. I've done enough good works. Well, I'm not there yet. I, I slipped up a couple of... No, no, it has nothing to do with what we do and with our works. It is the gift of God. You can't work for the gift of God. We're justified by grace, unmerited favor through our faith in Christ and his atoning work on the cross, period. No works on our part, no merit we can achieve. And that is the message that our culture needs today. They don't want to hear it. It's an offensive message. That it, 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 the culture denies absolute truth. This is a message of absolute truth. Denial of the truth Denial of the truth doesn't make it less true, does it? 
then denial of the truth doesn't alleviate our responsibility to speak the truth. The big question this morning is, whom are we trying to please? Men or God? Paul said you can't please men and be a servant of Christ. Would you bow with me this morning in the venue? Would you bow with me this morning in this room, online? We need to pause for just a moment and consider words of truth. These are not my words I've shared with you this morning. These are the words of truth. This, this is Scripture, the Word of God. We should always take time in the Word of God, whether it's here in, the, in a worship service, whether it's home in your own personal study. We should always take time to stop and reflect and to ask the question, God, what are you saying to me? You know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed thinking about the grace of God. All through Galatians, Paul keeps pointing them back. No, it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. It's not your works. And what a relief that should be that it's not about our works. It's not about having enough merit because we can't get there. It's just the grace of God. When, when is the last time you stopped and thanked God for his grace? Thank him that you don't have to earn or deserve his favor. I wonder if you consider your day-to-day -day life. If you would say that day-to-day that -day your life brings people face-to-face -face with the transforming power of the gospel. Can they see something different about you and how you live and how you speak and how you act. Do you know the truth? Can you recognize a false gospel? And the most important thing understand about the gospel message is that no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. No one comes to the Father but by Jesus. No family member, no friend, no co-worker, no good neighbor, no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. And even in a culture that denies the truth, we must speak forth the truth. You may have family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers who are part of some other denomination, some other religion. And you may think, well, well they're good. They're, they're part of that church. They're, they're connected there. They're involved there. They're not good if they don't know Jesus. They're not good if they're being taught that it's grace or it's faith plus works. They're not good. When you add works to the equation, you deny what Christ has done on the cross. You render it ineffective, insufficient, no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. Maybe even now he's bringing to your mind someone that you know that's of a false religion. Someone not trusting Christ alone. We must speak the truth. How it's received is not up to us. Whether it's denied is not up to us. We must speak the truth. Well, what has the Spirit of God said to you this morning? How do you need to respond?